Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Cardill, and with my colleagues and friends you see here behind me, Nick, Morgan, Michelle, Andrea, who will be uh, videoing in, uh, and David will be telling you about the new open access book uh, of tutorials for Earth Engine. We're really excited to tell you about it. We've been working on it for about a year or a year and a half, and uh, this is the first that people outside of the author's group will have a chance to hear uh, and, get a, and see and use the book. So when we're finished, we want you to understand each of the elements of the title. So the title, as you see here, this is new work. Uh, it is an open access book. It's designed for anyone, uh, either anyone in the room or anyone on the live stream or anyone after uh, the live stream has finished for the rest of, uh, the rest of time, uh, that we will be uh, offering you this book for teaching Earth Engine and that it's divided into two main groups, two big domains of fundamentals where we wanna give you the skills to be able to program on your own um, and applications so that you can see the various domains that Earth Engine is used in. Okay, so this is the agenda and we'll tell you uh, for a moment or two what we'll talk about today. First, we'll describe the new book uh, and give you a chance to access it yourself. Second, we'll walk you through a part of one of the chapters. Uh, for that part, you can follow along if you like or you can uh, just watch and you'll be able to keep up, I think, pretty well uh, with that as well. But if you're interested in copying and pasting from the actual book itself to the code editor, you can uh, get ready for that. Uh, and then third, we'll talk you through one of the fundamentals chapters. And finally, we'll tell you about things that we're looking forward to and that we'll be um, uh, implementing in the next few months and over the next year in order to make the book uh, more effective and better for you. And so uh, I'll spend a few minutes first showing you some of the highlights and the characteristics of the book. So uh, first of all, for background, we, we really did almost all of this uh, work uh, over, over video conferencing. And so this was kind of conceived of during the pandemic. Uh, and for me, at least, I wanted a way, as everything closed down, to be able to keep in touch with others and also to get to know some other people if that were possible uh, during the pandemic. And maybe because people had a little more time on their hands, uh, we've ended up with 55 chapters, uh, 100 authors, and about 1,200 pages. Uh, it's intended for people with all skill levels, as you'll see here uh, in a moment. I'll give you a little bit of detail of what we mean by that. And that it's a varied set of authors, everyone involved in the whole process, uh, except for the copy editing, which was done by professionals. Uh, but in the uh, generation of the ideas and the code and the text, that was all done by uh, volunteers. Uh, there's a vetted code repository, which you'll hear about uh, in a few minutes. We have a very large number of chapter reviews done by people uh, at all different levels, including uh, a set of high school students who reviewed uh, the entire book from beginning to end. Uh, it will be publishing as a formal, citable publication in late 22 uh, this year, or maybe early in 2023, and it's on Springer Open Publishing. We have, uh, you can think of there being maybe five audiences for the book, and we want this to be accessible for each of those audiences. We want a person who's an absolute beginner, uh, who's working alone, um, to be able to pick up the book and begin from maybe never having written any program whatsoever, uh, or someone who has written a program but is new to JavaScript, or um, has, is just a person who likes to start at the beginning, we want them to know where to come to. And in that case, they could come to what you'll see here in a moment is section one. Um, also, uh, second, people who have taken a class like Earth Engine 101, where you've done maybe three hours of learning, we want you also to be able to have a structured way to continue the learning that you did in that class. And for that, you can come in in section F2 and F3. We'll talk about those. They mention uh, classification and regression and the accuracy of models. Uh, and reducers, which some of you during this week may have heard uh, some details about also. For experienced users, uh, I'll show you some detail on what that one of those uh, sections looks like uh, if you're interested in change detection and time series interpretation algorithms. That would be a place where you also could jump in. Then for very experienced users, what I listed here is a question that I answered for one of my students with the book uh, just last week. I was trying to remember how to get the like 11th image out of, an Im out of an image collection. I knew I had seen it somewhere. I looked through the forums, I looked on Stack Exchange, I couldn't remember. 
Uh, and then I thought, oh, I think where I saw it was inside the book. So I went and did a, a text search in the book for uh, the nth image and found it within like two seconds and my student is on his way. And then also uh, we want, especially with the applications chapters, uh, for people who are just um, at the beginning of their careers and interested in trying to understand how could I use Earth Engine? Is it only for forest applications? I see a lot of examples in forests. Or could it be used for other things as well? And so we want people to be able to uh, picture themselves working in these diverse fields. And so this is uh, the first that anyone has seen the uh, URL for the book. It's www.efa, Earth Engine Fundamentals and Applications, dash book.org. There are also other combinations with and without the dash and org and dot com. Um, but in general, you can get uh, to it now and see these sections. So the sections that you see uh, described here, section F1, that was what I mentioned for absolute beginners. Uh, F2 for people who are interested in interpreting images, doing the basics. F3 is for more advanced applications of working with one, uh, one or a few uh, images. F4 I'll talk about in just a moment. F5 for vectors and table use. Some of you may have heard about uh, vector use in some of the other sessions here at geo for good uh, And then F6 for advanced topics. Then on the application side, we have that broken into three big domains. One being human applications, and you can probably see the, uh, the titles of each of the chapters here. Uh, and then aquatic and hydrological applications and terrestrial applications. So uh, I'll give you uh, a sense for maybe two minutes or so about what we imagine as the people who will begin in uh, chapter F1.0 for JavaScript and the Earth Engine API. So a person who really wants to start at the beginning, that's their place, or maybe they've never written a program before, like I had mentioned a minute ago. For uh, F1.1, that's for exploring images. That would be for a person who knows how to program or has just finished the last chapter but they have never really seen or used remote sensing data before. That's a place that they could come into uh, the book. Um, and if you are a person uh, who is wondering, just at a basic level, some of the images that I see, they look normal, and some of the images that I see are different colors than I would have expected. If that's the level that you come into it at, uh, that's, that's the chapter that you can do in order to understand how bands are selected, the different information that's carried by bands across different, uh, from different satellites. Then third, you may have heard or you've heard that there is a lot of imagery. You've probably seen a lot of imagery. Uh, what kinds of images exist? And is it all satellite data or are there pre-prepared data sets? And that's what we have in the survey of raster data sets chapter. Uh, and then finally, uh, here within this uh, F1 chapter or section, is for people who know uh, something about uh, programming but don't really know the vocabulary for remote sensing. So I know what spatial resolution is, but other people I talk to don't know what spatial resolution is. You can see also temporal resolution and spectral resolution mentioned here. Uh, and so we define each of those and explain them in the Earth Engine context. And we uh, also use spatial resolution of different satellites uh, in order to illustrate that within the chapter. So uh, that's the beginning part. Uh, and then later, we have uh, the F2, which I mentioned before, and F3. Here in F4, that is uh, sort of a transition where we move from uh, individual images to working with image collections. And so each of these chapters uh, is designed to answer one uh, big question. So for the first one, F4.0, what are the unique tools, filter, map, and reduce? What are those unique tools that I need in order to uh, succeed in this complicated sec section? Second, what even are image collections? Maybe I've seen that go by. I don't really know what they're useful for. What are they and how can I use them? Uh, third, F4.2, how can I cut down all of this data? If I have information that occurs uh, irregularly in time, how can I maybe have a monthly image? Uh, across, um, across a year. Uh, for clouds and image compositing, uh, you've, uh, that's a thing that we talk about every single day, more or less, within remote sensing. How can I get rid of clouds? We have a, a very long uh, and, and I think really useful chapter uh, for that. 
Uh, next, how can I compare across two images? So this is the first place where we have compared two images with each other. And so we've got some tools in there for comparing across two images. Next, what can I learn from multi-year data? Uh, and then 4.6, which you'll hear uh, some excerpts from in a few minutes as one of the demos that we have. How can I fit functions to uh, a time series of information? And then some of you may have heard of CCDC or seen a demo. Uh, so we have a, a chapter that explains it in the context of having fit functions to time series in the previous chapter. How can I use fitted harmonic functions? Uh, and then how can I merge a time series of classifications? If I have maybe a set of 100 dynamic world classifications, how can I uh, combine them together in some useful way? And then how can I explore time lags in time series? So I'll pass to Nick uh, in just about a minute now. What I wanna tell you about uh, just to finish is uh, this F6 as an illustration. That's the advanced topic section. That's designed for trying to move outward from your own uh, desk or your own laptop. If you wanna stretch to a larger area than you've been using before, you might look at uh, scaling up an Earth Engine F6.2. If you wanna share scripts and data and send something to someone else, uh, that is discussed uh, here in F6.1, collaborating in Earth Engine and also 6.3. Uh, for the basic user interface and apps. And then connecting with other platforms, there's a really interesting chapter about combining R with Earth Engine. And so I will pass to Nick, who will tell you about the code repository, the code checkpoints, and the things he's done to ensure that Google best practices uh, are All used. Right. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I'm Nick Clinton, Earth Engine Developer Relations. Uh, there is a ton of code that goes with this book. The authors have done a really fantastic job of, uh, first of all, writing the code and making it available to everybody. It's gone through extensive review at this point. So uh, I reviewed all the code to, to uh, ensure uh, that best practices were followed um, wherever possible and that it was formatted nicely and all that kind of stuff. All the code that you see in the book is linked to a repository in Earth Engine. And uh, so whatever section uh, of the book you're on, you'll be able to find the equivalent code sample uh, directly in the code editor. And this is the link uh, to get that code repository um, in, in your code editor. Uh, so anybody can add that right now and, and start exploring the code that's in there. And um, the, the point that we'd like to make is that this is a, a, a dynamic repository. So um, it's linked directly from the book. So uh, al although it's gone through review, we expect that there may be changes and, and bug fixes in the future. So uh, rest assured that uh, when you get uh, a link from, uh, to one of these code samples, uh, it'll be the most recent uh, working example. Uh, I think I'm handing this off to Morgan now. Thanks, Nick, yeah. so. We want to emphasize that this was really a community developed book. And so there's a variety of authors, many that you see here, but there's over 70 more than just on this screen. Um, we really drew upon our networks from Geo for Good to find um, folks who have varying geographic locations, domain expertise, career stages, sectors, and teaching objectives so that you can find a chapter that will fit your need and from an objective standpoint that will also fit it. So we really wanna give a shout out to our authors and thank them for their time to make sure that this book happened. All right, back to you, Jeff. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sure, and so now we'll hear from one of those authors, uh, Michelle Stuhlmacher, who will uh, walk you through some stuff from the applications right. half of the book. Okay, so just a little bit of background on the chapter I'll walk you through. Um, I wrote this chapter along with Dr. Ron Goldblatt, who is at New Light Technologies in DC, and this is one of the more introductory level chapters. It's something that I teach in my kind of intro to, to remote sensing course. Um, and so first we start students off with just like seeing what you can see in the landscape um, regarding urbanization. So we've got this um, airport that was built in India between um, 2010 and 2020, and so that'll be one of the live code demos we do. And then I have students kind of look through what the existing 
um, classifications have in terms of urban classifications, learn how to interact with that, um, and then do like a reduced regions to, to pull out some quantitative information from those. Um, and then the last bit uh, we won't cover in the live demo, but uh, just kind of give you a taste. So um, here's what a book chapter looks like. So this is a lot of the same information I just touched on, um, you know, the learning outcomes and the things that you need to know before you start this chapter. So this is the um, application section. So, you know, if you need to go back, find something in the fundamental section, teach yourself it, and then come back to this section. It kind of points you on where you need to head. Um, so, so we'll start with the animated GIF one. Um, we'll, we'll, this is what it looks like, and then I'll, can I switch over to the, um, to the demo and, and we'll do it together. And I'll also note that like there's the repository, but there's also the, the code checkpoints at the end of each one. Okay, so we're gonna do the, um, like the time series animation one all together. We'll role play as users of this book. Um, so the first thing we have the, the users, you know, a little bit about where we're headed and then, you know, the region we need to search to, uh, to build the animation. So there we are. And then this is the airport. So we'll draw our box around it, um, you know, having, the, having them do the geometry tools, and then, you know, what to search to find that, that image collection that we'll use. Um, and I think it's tier one. And then to rename it to the L8. So yeah, so like telling them what to search for, what to look for, what to rename it as, and then um, the exact code blocks they would need to do to get to that GIF. So something I just learned this morning is um, all of these code blocks are triple clickable for copying and pasting, so you can just um, pop it right into your code that way. So here's our first step. We're just filtering our, our image collection, doing the geometry, the dates, um, limiting by the cloud cover, and then we'll set up the visualization arguments for the, the GIF or the GIF, depending on what camp you belong to. Um, yeah, so here's our, here's our visualization. We've got our bands, we've got the min and the max, the, the geometry which we just drew, the number of frames, um, and the format that we want it in. And then last is just rendering it in the console. Triple click, there we go. Okay, so then we'll hit run, and hopefully we'll get it, there we go. Um, and so there we have our time series animation. So just kind of like starting off the chapter, giving them something to, to sink their teeth into, see what it looks like, um, and then we go on into, the, um, into the, the classification piece. So I'll just do a little bit of um, signposting. So we just did the, the first learning objective, the first learning outcome, and now we're gonna do the, um, the quantitative and qualitative analysis. Um, and for this one, we're not gonna do copying and pasting, but I just wanted you to see what the repo that Nick talked about looked like, um, and, the, and then how the different code checkpoints throughout the, the chapters kind of point you back to the repo. If you, you know, you know, didn't put in the right image collection, didn't get the result you thought you would get, you can always just pop back to the repo, find that, find a working version of that code, and, and proceed on in a chapter. Um, so here is that again. Um, so here's the repo. There's the part A applications and then um, the part F for fundamentals. And so we're in the human application section in the urban environments. This is the, um, the one we just ran through with the, um, with the GIF. There we are. Um, and then this is like the first, the first checkpoint I have um, in this section. So this one we uh, run through MODIS. And so the chapter kind of talks through how to read the documentation, how to figure out um, you know, what bands to select, the colors to visualize them as, and to, to run the, um, just like the generic full visualization of the land cover, and then the, um, the filtering to get just the urban classes, and, and getting that so you can visualize the different years, so like how urbanization has changed um, here in, in Ghana. Okay, so that's the first one. I also have uh, uh, Corine and NLCD, just having the having the students understand that like some some classifications use um, just one urban class like we saw with Modis, but in this one there's multiple urban classes, so you have to kind of filter those bands differently. Um, this one's very similar. 
uh, you know, visualizing the two different years over London. And then our last one is the NLCD, which is over the United States. Um, there we are. And so first having them uh, you know, see what the full visualization of the classification looks like, and then you know, pulling out the, the highest um, development intensity. All right, can we switch back to the, the slide deck, please? Perfect, okay, so, so yeah, so that's just what we ran through in terms of the second learning outcomes. You can kind of see, you know, as you read through the chapter, the, the checkpoints that correspond to it, things like that, and then to close this section, um, I have the students answer a couple of questions, and it's because, like, often, I mean, we're all guilty of this, but you're like, oh, great, new code, and you, like, copy-paste, 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 and then you're like, oh, but do I understand it? Um, and so that's what this spot is, to get, get the students to stop, make sure they've understood what they've done. Um, this, the first question, for example, I have them, you know, return to the MODIS classification, um, have them tinker it ar around with that initial visualization of all the land cover classes to be able to answer, you know, what, what types of land cover classes were urbanized um, between 2002 and 2019. And then same with the NLCD, like I have here, oh, you can't see it anymore. In the NLCD one, they, um, I have them do a reduce regions uh, and calculate the area of the highly developed, um, the highly developed land. And so I have them do that again for 2016. So I have the 2021, 2016, and then they can you know, produce a number for how much that, that class has increased over those years. And then question three is kind of bringing it all together, like what are the trade-offs in the, in the spatial resolution and the temporal resolution of these different classifications? How many different urban classes do they have? How comparable are they? Um, to just kind of give that context. And then you know, the last part of this section, students um, the, the bottom two bullet points are students do their own random forest classification to, um, to, you know, like now they've seen some of the existing ones and their limitations, so now they can control the, the pixel size or the time, the time that the classification has run over and so be able to do their own classification as well. Okay, and then it's Andrea. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we are going to switch uh, to hear uh, a remote uh, demo from one of, the app, uh, one of the fundamentals chapters. So if we could switch to the video connection, that's where we'll continue. All right, Andrea, if you can hear us, you can uh, jump right in. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jeff, and hi, everyone. First, I just want to say that I'm really happy to be able to participate virtually in this session and in geo for good in general. So myself, along with others that you can see on the next slide, um, Karen, B, Blob, David, and Nick, wrote this chapter based on mm -hmm. old lab exercises that Nick and David had for teaching classes at the university level. And we have chosen this particular fundamental chapter for this presentation because we wanted to show you that the book also addresses advanced topics, as Jeff has mentioned. So this particular chapter is about fitting functions to time series. And as you can see here at the bottom of the slide, there are many prerequisites, which are earlier chapters in the book, to be able to go through these lessons. You can open this chapter by using the link at the top left there, so bit.ly slash eefa dash f. 46, or the QR code at the top right. Next slide, please. So the motivation behind this chapter is that we know many natural and man-made phenomena present important annual, interannual, or long-term trends, for example, the phenology of specific crops. And the main objective of this chapter is to show the users how to fit a function into a time series of satellite data so that later on, they are able to track deviations from a trend, for example. And we did this in four ways or steps that you can see there at the bottom. We first identified the linear trend of a time series. Then we removed the linear trend or detrend this time series. Third, we fit a sine wave or a harmonic model. And finally, we show higher order harmonic models so the user can get used to it. We won't be going through all these steps in code detail here in the interest of time, but we'll go through all the sections and highlight the code part of some of them, like the training and feeding a harmonic model. 
So next slide, please. The first section of the chapter addresses how we have multi-temporal data in Earth engine. So we talk about how each pixel, there, for each pixel, there might be a distinct number of observations for a given set of dates and how data may be missing due to cloud masking, for example. Similar to what our colleague Ujava was mentioning at his talk yesterday, if you attended it. We can see how the pixel, how a value for pixel PT on the chart, for example, changes over time too. We can also, we also talk about per pixel fitting. So how we can use a simple linear function such as y equals mx plus b um, can be used to fit through a set of values. And we also talk about array images, which are higher order image structure in Earth Engine. This concept of um, array images is important throughout the chapter, so we make sure to introduce it here at the beginning. Next slide. In section two, we repeat many of the steps that are addressed in previous chapters, such as filtering an image collection to a specific date and location, and DVI image calculation, cloud masking, scaling, all these pre-processing steps that we are used uh, to work with. So here you can see the importance of the user having a foundation from previous fundamental chapters, because they will be using this um, in many of these advanced chapters. In this particular chapter, we work with a time series of Landsat 8 images from 2013 to 2017 at a point of interest in California. And at the end of this section two, we plot a time series of NDVI, which will be the object of study. And you can see there on the slide, you can see there are many gaps there. Next slide, please. We also show at this uh, section how to add the trend line to the chart that you can see there in red. And we do this by using the trend lines parameter contained in the chart set options function. And we can see that we have a linear upwards trend in the time series. Next slide. This is just so you can see where the point of interest of this chapter is located, which is close uh, to you all there in uh, geo for good Next slide. Then in section three, and you can follow the code on the side by using the link on the slides if you want. We can reproduce this linear trend that we have just seen in, from the previous uh, slide and remove it from the time series. So in other words, we'll be detrending the time series. Uh, we do this because uh, detrended time series are much easier to model. And you can see here an example of a detrended time series that we'll get at the end of this section. Next slide. You can see now that we'll have the same code checkpoint that is from the previous slide, but we'll have lines indicated so you can follow along if you open this into an external tab. So we start the section three by applying a linear regression to get the values of the linear model we saw. Here is the specific code block that does that in the script. And we can see that we first define our independent and dependent variables. Here we are using NDVI as a dependent variable and a constant and time as an independent variables. Next slide. And here highlighted, we apply the linear regression through the linear regression reducer to compute the linear trend. The resulting image will be actually an array image with one band being the residuals or the errors from the equation and another band being a two by one band with the coefficients of the model since we have two coefficients or independent variables, and that's why we have the two by one band. And here's the importance of defining array image at the very beginning of the chapter, because once they see here array image, they won't get lost. Next slide. Next, here highlighted, we flatten this array image in order to get rid of the extra dimensions, in this case, the residuals, and end up with a regular two band image. Next slide. Then we remove the trend of the time series by subtracting the second part of the linear model from the NDVI values. And here we can see the power of Earth Engine because we're doing linear regressions and detraining a time series at each pixel of the image. So it's very highly computational. Next slide. Here's the exact part of that code where we are removing the trend 
And as a result, you can see at the bottom of the slide the plotted time series with no trend, which would be the, the red line. Next line. In section four of this chapter, we estimate seasonality with a harmonic model. We first add the harmonic variables. Since we're talking harmonics, we have cosine and sine, which will be the third and a fourth uh, coefficients on the model equation that you can see there. Secondly, we fit the model using uh, the linear regression reducer, just like we have done previously. And finally, we compute the fitted values and plot the harmonic model. You can also open this code checkpoint to see the script if you want. Next slide. So we first add the harmonic variables, variables as image bands. Next slide. You can see exactly at the highlighted parts that we are adding cosine and sine as independent variables and adding those values as bands to each image in the image collection. Also note that we do the time conversion to radians here, which is very important. Next slide. Then we fit the model with the linear regression reducer, just like we have done previously. But this time we have a four band image instead of a two band image. Next slide. Now we compute the fitted values. We first flatten the array image like we have done previously. Next slide. And then as you can see in the code, we fit the values and add the fitted values as a new band to each image. It is the same procedure we have done before, but now we have more coefficients. Next slide. And finally, we plot the harmonic curve for that specific point in California, which you can see here um, on the slide. Next one. There is an extra step that we do in this section, which is calculating the phase and the amplitude. So phase and amplitude can give us additional information. And we know that, for example, agricultural crops with different, different phenological cycles can be distinguished with phase and amplitude information. Something that perhaps would not be possible with spectral information alone. So we show how to do that. And that leads us into section five, which is an application of curve fitting. In this section, we won't focus on one point location, but rather look at the resulting image as a whole. So the, result, the resulting image, which you can see there on this line, can, uh, gives us a rich variability of the landscape in Modesto, California. So it shows differences between crop types, urban and natural areas. Something that with spectral information alone would not have been possible to capture. Um, how cool are those colors, right? Next slide. Finally, in section six, we show the user how to produce higher order harmonic models. In some situations, there may be more than one cycle within a given year. For example, when our agriculture field is double cropped. So we have a script that exemplifies how to produce these models. And you can see here how a harmonic model plot with three cycles per year looks like. And it's the same point over California. Next slide. This specific script is structured in a way that you can define one or more cycles per year uh, to model which is the variable harmonics there that you can see on the slide. So if you open this code checkpoint, you can test different um, harmonic cycles. Next slide, please. And finally, at the end of the chapter, um, we leave an assignment to the reader where we ask for them to plot two harmonic models, one prior to a disturbance event in Manaus and one after the same disturbance event. They can use a code checkpoint as the starting point so they don't start from scratch. And the goal of this assignment, although simple, is to show that sometimes we have breaks in the time series or breaks in the trend. This is a, an introduction to following chapters that address change detection time series, such as the chapter about the CCBC algorithm that Jeff mentioned, and another one that we have in applications chapter, which is the coded algorithm. So if you have um, any questions regarding the chapter or the code, please ask Nick, who is in person there. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Next slide. And with that, I'll turn it over to David, who will be sharing all the exciting future plans for the book. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, David Song with the University of San Francisco. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate that this has been a labor of love over the past, I don't know how many years. <laughs> 
several years by literally hundreds of people in the community. And uh, there's a bunch of questions that keep popping up. You know, the first question, if you hit the next slide. There's a clicker. I'll just grab the clicker myself. Yeah. First question is like, how good is this stuff? Is this stuff any good, <laughs> right? There's like 1,200 pages is really hard to check. Nick's amazing. You're great, but you're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. There's gonna be mistakes, right? Um, so with that, there were there was tons of reviews, 350 plus reviewers for all the different chapters. And I have to hand it to Jeff. He's very meticulous in terms of the metrics that we capture on things. Big hand, uh, shout out to him. We were able to capture all kinds of stuff. Uh, how long does each chapter take to, to complete? The spiciness level of every single chapter? The difficulty to use? Um, all that sort of stuff has been captured and we're able to share that. So that gives us an idea of how this, this body of knowledge could actually work together, fit together for a wide variety of uh, users. That said, there's mistakes. So at the bottom of each chapter, which uh, we weren't showing you guys, there's a link. If you find a mistake or you find a recommendation, there's, there's an ongoing requirement for you to give us feedback so we can improve on it. Right, so this, this review, even though there's been a lot of review on it, we're hoping will be uh, an ongoing process for all of us. Next thing is like, what, where are we gonna go from here? There's a lot of different directions we can go, but there's, there's some, some main ones that we wanna focus in on. First one, videos, videos are coming. We are very excited about making videos. And, and again, we want the face and the voice of this book to reflect the diversity uh, of folks that are using this material. So um, there's a bunch of chapters. We're hoping to get one chapter, a video out per week, per month. What do we say? Per week. Holy <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, one chapter <laughs> per, per week. This is why Jeff is driving all of us. Um, and so we, we want to we be able to do this on an ongoing basis we are not gonna be the ones recording all these videos. So we want people to sign up for it. Sign up, get engaged, uh, uh, figure out which chapter you're interested in. You don't have to be an author to record a video, right? You don't have to be a, a Google Earth Engine expert or a professor to record a video. If you have an interest in doing this and showing this information, please let us know there's a link that you could actually attach to it. Second, there's some videos already ready to go. Right? Some of them are, um, what would, we have a couple up here. We have the first one October 17th with Ujival. Uh There's one October 24th with Jeff, uh, so on and so forth. So if you wanna actually see some of these videos, uh, go to that link up there and sign up for it. Um, you know, you could be, you could be you, if you wanna watch one, see how it actually works, then sign up for one so you can get involved. Uh, please get engaged in that process. Um, that said, habla espanol, parli vous francés, faham arabi. If any of that makes sense to you, we want to translate this into a variety of languages. Um, not only the video, but the text. And so there's going to be um, uh, an ability to sign up uh, and uh, volunteer for that. That's, again, trying to figure out how to extend this community uh, and really showcase the diversity of users. So somebody who's working on one of these projects um, in Western Africa who speaks French isn't isolated or having to translate to Eng go from English to French to, to try to learn it, we could try to get it in there in uh, some of these um, you know, more common languages. Um, there is a link for that as well. Uh, up there, you can sign up for it. Um, where is Emil Sherrington? There is Twitter, Emil. <clears throat> <laughs> You're already on it, thank you. Everyone grab that handle right now. It's okay to pull out your phones. Follow it now, feed it out now. The idea is too is we wanna get stories out. Uh, if you're using this in any sort of setting, please share it. Uh, if you find something that's really useful, please share it. If you find something that we could all improve and learn from or we're missing, please share it, <laughs> right? But, but get involved in that, it's gonna be helpful uh, for all of us. Um, Next thing, when you look at the content, so con uh, you know, but Nick and Michelle and Andrea showed the code repository. Um, please access it. But you know, teaching is more than just the code repository. There's a bunch of material that goes along with it that, that we know we all need. There's presentations, there's notes, there's images. 
the idea is to open all of that up and make that available and accessible as well. So when we're, whenever we're designing any of the materials for the book, we're designing it in a way that it's open so you could actually use it uh, with, with being in full uh, compliance with the copyright gods, laws, that sort of thing. <laughs> um, so there's an intention to keep all the different materials open. Along with the slides, if people are producing slides, um, if you look at the way that content was actually developed, <coughs> if you take a step back and say, well, hey, well, why did you guys develop it the way you guys thought about it? When we first conceptualized the class, we conceptualized each of the chapters being like a three-hour block. Um, and the reason for that is so that this thing could be modular. No one's gonna teach 50 chapters in one, <laughs> one semester. Or maybe somebody, as Stacy, you might. But most folks won't. Right? It, it's it's going to be modular for the way you actually teach your own class. I know for us at USF, University of San Francisco, we teach our classes in eight-week blocks, three-hour chunks. And so the way that we're, we're going to apply this, uh, this class, uh, these chapters, these configurations, it's going to work well for our environment. We're going to package it up and put it in a place where everyone else could use it. The SEVERE program is another place uh, that's non-academic. And the reason why I bring up SEVERE is that this book was designed for academic use as well as non-academic capacity building use. Uh, the way that they configure and use these classes for two-day or three-day workshops uh, is similar to the way that we do in the university, but it's for a different target audience and it might be a different configuration of chapters. They're going to develop material and content that would also be great to share. So there's going to be a space for all this information to go back and forth between folks. Next thing, this again, going back to the thanks. Um, and there's a lot of different folks here. Um, it's, if you're an author, raise your hand. I'm seeing a lot of folks in the virtual world. Thank you for meeting your deadlines. <laughs> <laughs> I just sent out a bunch of scary emails, very kind, scary emails. <laughs> um, and actually, uh, we were kind of shocked how, how well people responded to them. Um, there was, there was a, a, a lot of great care and need and, um, generosity and time in terms of what people were able to contribute to this thing. And there's a huge thanks to all the authors. Um, the other one is the editors that um, Jeff talked about, Christine, Jose, and Mark, where they spent a lot of time, uh, none of them knew anything about remote sensing or Earth Engine or any of this stuff. But by the end, Mark was an Earth Engine expert. Um, and, and the time and energy and care that they spent uh, treating this book more than just a job, a gig, they actually got into it and they cared about the voice, they cared about the narrative. Uh, and one thing that was really neat about that process was that none of them had a desire to learn this to begin with, but as they read through it, they really ha helped identify or highlight where we had some challenges in the book or where we had some inconsistencies and they were able to work through that. Severe is another major program uh, that we'd like to think a lot of the content that was developed with this process and support came from Severe, which is a joint USA NASA funded product um, program. Wanted to give a big thanks to them. Silva Carbon uh, and the great country of Canada um, also contributed a lot of time uh, and energy and support for the development of this book. Um, where is Eileen's not here, isn't she? No, not here. Or Ellen. Ellen, Ellen. <clears throat> Jeff, can you say a couple words about Ellen? <laughs> Uh, sure. Uh, a year ago, we did uh, an online session where we said there will be a book uh, at some point. Uh, and if you want to help out uh, reviewing any of the chapters of the book, please let us know. So in fact, uh, not just Ellen, but about 10 people responded from there. Uh, some did about 10 chapters, a few did four, uh, several did two or three, and then uh, went on to other things. Uh, Ellen, uh, did the entire book three times. <laughs> and so she consistently and constantly made uh, comments of all sorts. Like there are two spaces between these words, please compress it. <laughs> or I don't understand this point, can you please uh, try to explain it a bit better? So yeah, we really do wanna uh, give a special shout out to her. She did uh, truly uh, impossible to imagine uh, amount and quality of work. Yeah, and then uh, there's a couple students too. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, two students uh, within my group, uh, in order to make sure that the code uh, actually worked, we knew that we had written the code, we figured we had put it properly into the code repository, 
And so they copy and pasted every single piece of code into the code repository, ran it, checked to see if it produced the figure that it said that it produced, or maybe if it had been mixed up. Uh, one began in the fundamental section, one began in the application section. As they proceeded down, they got to the end of their half and then resumed with the other half and went through and each, the second time through was almost completely bug free. There will be bugs, but I think there were, either, there used to be a lot more bugs. No, and now you. they uh, have really ironed out, uh, I think, a lot of the inconsistencies that would be very frustrating if you're sitting at home and you push on something and it doesn't work. And so uh, the two of them sitting at home in their homes, talking with me over uh, video conferencing, uh, they you know, confirmed bit by bit that the code uh, does do to the best of our abilities uh, what we, uh, meaning the authors, uh, intend for it to do. Thank you. Um, also the Earth Engine team, Nick, the, the team that you had to help support this, uh, there, there was a massive amount of support in the background to ensure that we had the right content in the right place with the right kind of support. Um, Google also sponsored the fact that this book remains open and free and accessible to everybody. So that, that is something that's huge. So when this book does come out, it, the idea is that you could share with everyone uh, the content. Um, also, please spread the word. Um, this is version one. Of, of this effort, we'd like to ensure that there's a version two with constant learning. So there's a chapter or a concept or uh, an element that you'd like to, to contribute for the next iteration of this thing, please reach out to us. Um, the book itself, uh, I know this link's been up a couple of times. Please make sure you capture that. Um, Jeff, would it be okay if we went and looked at some of the things live from the website? Uh, sure, I think we can do that, yeah. maybe. I've got to pull this. Yep. Yeah. I'll just log if, you in. If we could do that. And um, while Michelle's pulling that up, I just wanted to uh, give a couple other little examples of how we're planning on using this thing. You ready? Is it up there? Oh, we got to switch over? Okay. Can we switch to the... Wonderful. All right. So... <laughs> This is a draft copy of the book. The book hasn't been officially published by Springer yet. Springer is going to be the publisher of the book, but we wanted to make sure people got to see it and use it. So the, all the content here is free for you guys to use. Uh, a couple, of, uh, some universities are currently using this right now, and they're creating syllabi with it for different components. Feel free if you if you have an Earth Engine class that you need to teach. All this content is available to you. Two things: uh, use it, use it, use it. Uh, and let us know where there's errors. And item number two, if you do have a syllabi that you're using or creating content, please share back with us as well. Um, Jeff, did you want to talk through a couple of the elements in here? Like show uh, sure. Uh, so you can see we've got the ability to uh, go to the book and see that slide that I showed, you know, maybe five or six slides in that shows these kind of um, example figures from each of those sections. We can click on them and then go in and take a look. So if we want to go, for example, to, uh, to the stuff that Andrea showed, we'll go here to section four. And that takes us to this Google Doc, uh, which is how we wrote the book, basically. We said to everyone, please paste all of your stuff into this crazy Google document. Uh, we soon discovered that Google documents have a maximum, so we split it in half. Can you then fix we that, discovered Google? that those Google documents also have a maximum and ended up now there are about, uh, there's one for about every one of these sections. If I can bring up the, um, the outline here, you can see we can get down to uh, 4.6 and see the stuff that uh, Andrea was showing. And so that takes us through uh, the learning outcomes that she mentioned, the, uh, the pieces that this chapter uh, relies on or would greatly benefit from you knowing how to do. One thing that we spent a lot of time on was trying to make sure that you didn't need to do, if you were on page 900, that you didn't need to do all 900 of the pages prior to that, but that the, that the learning would build on top of it, but that the data would each be self-contained. So the idea, and I think it's worked out well, is that you can go to any of the chapters and execute it from beginning to end with the information that's contained within that chapter. And so you would be able to see uh, here, there's you know, the figures that she showed. If I go down to uh, the end, which is the beginning of the next 
chapter, uh, you can see here the thing that Dave mentioned about uh, the feedback. So the reviews that people give uh, in the future will go into that table that we showed uh, as that. A big part of what we're trying to do with that is for an individual working who's not involved with Earth Engine but is curious, they would, I, I think it's useful in my own classes I do this, uh, it's useful for them to know, is this gonna take me 10 hours or is it gonna take me an hour and a half? To have a, a distinction between a chapter that is enormous that you need to dedicate time for versus this is a chapter that you can pretty much copy and paste and you'll be done with it in an hour or two hours. Uh, we find that's pretty useful. Uh, and then the, uh, the efficiency of learning, the usefulness that Dave mentioned, is one of the questions that we ask here is, is it worth doing this chapter? Just in a basic sense, you put in a certain amount of time, was it worth it to do this chapter? And so in the long term, the chapters that score uh, lower, we will try to fix those and look especially at those comments and try to make those stronger if that sort of thing comes up. So coming back just for a moment, back to the, uh, to the translations, uh, the web page that was made was made um, uh, by an individual in Montreal uh, who has a company. I'll make sure that she puts her uh, link on here because I think this is a really, really, really well done website. Uh, because it's in Montreal, she also speaks French. And she said, oh, you mentioned this about uh, the translations. Do you want me to translate not the whole 1,200 pages of the books, but the, uh, the table of uh, materials. And so you can see here, she's done the beginnings of that for us to illustrate what we want the translated versions to look like. The idea is eventually you would be able to click on uh, view section 1.2. That would take you to a version that for a while would be partially translated. It would be in English at the beginning, but when someone uh, who's sufficiently motivated was doing that chapter, if French is a comfortable language for them, they would go and actually change the text in this copy, in the French copy of the book. Uh, and that's the goal. And so we show here, uh, French is mentioned and Spanish is mentioned, but it could be translated into Bahasa. It could be translated into Mandarin. That would be fantastic and we would encourage any of that uh, even if it doesn't go all the way to being completely translated in a particular language, maybe it gets translated 80% of the way, and that's a lot better than 0% of the way. Yeah, and um, there's some common questions that we've been getting on an ongoing basis, and I'll just answer, I'll show, we'll share some of them, give our generic answer, then maybe we could open up if people do have questions about this. One of the questions is, why did you guys publish this as a book? Why don't you create this as a living document? Right, and so our answer is we're gonna do both. The idea behind getting it pushed out as a book is that it's something that's citable. A lot of the authors that are actually pushing stuff out is, is necessary for their professional growth, uh, professional pathways, that sort of stuff. That said, we do wanna maintain uh, an information site like this, and we do wanna uh, be able to incorporate new chapters, new bits of information in a very collective way. And so the idea is that once we get to a point where there's enough of a version shift or change, we could issue version two of the book with a larger community that contributed to it. We wanna be able to do that on an ongoing basis that matches the look, shape, feel, languages uh, of the community that's growing. So that's one, co that's one question and comment that we hear quite a bit. Uh, the next question that we hear quite a bit is like, this is gonna be so hard it's gonna be really hard to use, right? And, and that's where the, the sharing is really important uh, because it's, it's kind of daunting to build some of these classes. I know when we first built the first Earth Engine class that we taught together, there was nothing out there and it was kind of terrifying, right? And then you look at something like Esri where they prepackage everything for you, they spoon food it to you. There was a barrier to entry to get even that first workflow up and running what we're hoping by doing this as a community is to eliminate that educational barrier, whether it's in academia or some of these capacity building efforts. So there's an, uh, one of the next steps for us is, is really driving that home. The third question that you hear quite a bit of is how, how can I get involved? I don't have a lot of time now, but I have a lot of time later. This is gonna be an evol this is, this, we're not stopping, this is gonna be an evolving sort of uh, thing that we maintain to, uh, on an ongoing basis. There's always room to get involved, 
Um, so if, if you have a concept or an idea, and I, this is like the third time we, uh, we've said this, please reach out. We want to incorporate your thoughts, your ideas, uh, your concepts. Um, and with that said, if there's any questions, we have four minutes and 53 seconds left. <laughs> if there's any pressing questions, go ahead, Sam. Yeah, I just have the online questions I can read out. Sure, that would be great. <clears throat> Thank you, Sam. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So I answered a few of them, but I think a few of them would benefit from some extra clarity. Um, there was a question on, is there any application example of flood modeling or hydrological extreme and climate change studies? I know there's a chapter on droughts, but is there anything specific on flooding that anyone know in there? Uh, there's... I think there's a little embedded in A2.3, yeah. okay. surface water mapping. Good to know. Uh, I will add that to the answer then. Okay. Yeah, cool. and I think, I think maybe the bigger picture uh, is that this is where we cut it off in terms of the applications. We, we didn't try and we don't think that this is a complete set of all of the applications. If you went, for example, uh, to any of the breakout rooms uh, upstairs within this room that we're in, I heard presentation after presentation that I thought, oh man, that would be a really good chapter. That would be a really good chapter. <laughs> and that next one also would be a really good chapter. So if you feel that you have something that really would make sense to share, but you, and you see a hole in the uh, range of applications, we're, <laughs> we're a little nervously willing to do it. Um, we're willing to do it. We're okay, we're willing to do it. <laughs> but um, I, I think the possibilities of expanding, especially in this domain, uh, this chunk, uh, are really exciting to me because I think we've got an illustration of what you can use, but it's not in any way a complete set of what people use their attention for. Okay. Um, there was another question, which was, is an answer key available for the end of section exercises if you are using this text outside of classroom? So I know my section has an answer key. But yeah, I don't know if you want to speak to it. Your section <laughs> is the best section. <laughs> yeah. So okay, the job. materials for the classes are so far at this moment the least developed. Um, what we did do in, I think, almost every case is we asked that if, there is, uh, if there's a script that gets developed as one of the questions, to answer one of the questions, that the authors write that script and include it. So if you go, uh, you may have noticed the A4.6S1. Uh, and so it's that's- It's crazy that you have these memorized. <laughs> <laughs> no, I saw it here on the screen. Uh, so uh, that's- uh, for Andrea's chapter okay. 4.6, it's uh, the answer script yeah. for that first uh, one. And I can speak for the Active Fire um, chapter. In that one, our questions are more about interpretation and learning and kind of becoming the remote, remote sensing scientist yourself. Mm -hmm. So there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer. It's about the student gaining the confidence to look through things and think about what would be best in their application. Um, so that's why some of the chapters might not have an answer key because it's really it's uh, about that interpretation part. So Sam, we have about a minute left, minute and a half left, so get the, big, the next biggest question. Yeah, the next biggest question was on, this book is great. Uh, there's already uh, Earth Engine guides. Uh, what, how exactly does the book play with the Earth Engine guides? It's the Earth Engine community guides, you know, that are already out there. Yeah, let me, let me address that. Um, there, are multiple sets of docs for Earth Engine. There are our official docs. There are also community contributions to those docs. And, uh, but the book is different. Uh, the book is more of an academic uh, teaching aid or a learning aid. So um, our, our official product documentation is, to, is for practitioners to learn sort of the nuts and bolts of Earth Engine the community contributions are whatever you want, but the, each of them stands alone. The book is a synthesis of a whole variety of topics, uh, specifically fundamentals and applications using Earth Engine. Uh, Earth Engine sort of shifted the paradigm of remote sensing, and we found that there wasn't really a great textbook for that. So the idea of this is to fill that gap for uh, people who want to learn and people who want to teach with Earth Engine, so that's that's the difference from our other docs. Sounds great, and some di people did ask questions on translations, I just wanna give people a quick tip. You can, these are all Google Docs, if you make a copy, 
And then you can go into tools and click on translate and translate the document into any language you want. Remember, the code is also text, so the code will automatically translate to that language, which is, makes it unusable, but at least you can read the text in any other language you want, at least as a starting point. Thanks. Thank you, and we are out of time. Thank you, guys.